All righty. Well, first of all, my name is Ashley McDaniel. I am the founder of Southeast Texas Young Republicans. I'm one of the host organizations for this night. Um, we will also be joined by the Texas Republican Liberty Caucus and the Texas Shark Pack, Shark Tank Pack, which um, on behalf of all three of the hosts, we appreciate everybody coming out to support um, our awesome HD 23rd candidates. Tonight we are going to have kind of like an interview style where we will have the first candidate, which will be Representative Wayne Faircloth, um, step up. He will have an equal time to introduce himself to all of you. Four questions that he has already seen moderated by Felicia Bull, who is the Texas Young Republican Federation National Committee woman. Um, and Keith Nielsen has hit a little bit of traffic, so I'm just going to step in for him on his part of it. I'd like to thank Kristen Roy, who is our timekeeper and from Chambers County here. And we will go through the questions. They will receive all equal amount of time. Representative Faircloth will step out, and we will repeat the same process with Mr. Mace Middleton. Um, and so I have some special helpers now that is going to lead, help us lead us in the pledges and prayer to kick us off this evening. We have Ms. Bailey Bourne, Ms. Leah Bourne, and Ms. Rolandon Bourne, and Mr. Logan Bourne. Please stand with us as we do the pledges. Please join me for the pledge, pledge to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. join me in the pledge to the uh, Texas flag. Under the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Alrighty, and now we will have a prayer by Ms. Cheryl Lawson. Thank you, Father God, that we were blessed through no effort of our own to be born in America, the greatest country on the face of the earth. Father God, as we gather tonight, I pray that you would grant everyone ears to hear, hearts that are receptive, grant discernment. Father God, I pray the truth would be spoken, you would grant clarity, and you would help the, the, the citizens lead God and direct the citizens and who to choose for their leaders. Thank you again that we are in a country where we do get to choose our leaders. Grant us wisdom and thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Alrighty, while tonight is primarily about our House District 23 candidates, I did want to give some time to honor those candidates and elected officials who have came out and supported the organizations tonight. And so, whenever your name is called, if you'll just give a little wave so that way the voters can know where to find you guys, that would be wonderful. I'm Suzette Griffin. I'm with the Southeast Texas Shark Pack, and we are so happy to see all of you guys here tonight. Um, I'm going to have a hard time with some of your names, but you'll help me out. The first one is going to be Larry George. I got that one. Larry. Thank you for being here. Uh, 
Jimmy Silva for donating the facility and Commissioner George for being so gracious to let us host our event here. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for your support. Christmas. Glad to see each of you here. I appreciate uh, the Southeast Texas Young Republicans and all the elected officials that are here. Let me tell you something. If you've never run for office, I wish you would. Because you can't appreciate what it takes to do it. You really can't. It's an incredible, incredible undertaking. And it's difficult at best on your own. It's even more difficult with your family involved. So, let me just say this. I'm Wayne Faircloth. I am the current state representative for House District 23. I am the first Republican ever to represent House District 23. I'm a constitutional conservative. What does that mean? We follow the Constitution. What does it mean to be a Republican? I'll tell you what it means. There's so much rhetoric today, there's so much hate, there's so much vitriol being spit across at each other, it's, it's not funny anymore. It's not funny. It's not fun for anybody. And it's not right. We're not the enemy. We are not the enemy. We're not Washington, D.C. We represent the down-home people right here that live, work, play, worship together. We do. I was born and raised in Cleveland, Texas, really outside of Cleveland. I was born in Leggett Memorial Hospital in Cleveland. It's not there anymore. I went to school at Tarkington High School. My senior year, our football team made possible for the fact that Barbers Hill was co-champs at state. <laughs> yes. I grew up on a farm. By the time I was 14, I was in the hay business. And we weren't hauling round bales, Lamont. We were hauling square bales. And that's how I made a living. That's how I made a living. I was involved in Future Farmers of America. We won every contest that they ever had out there. We won fourth in state in parliamentary procedure. Chapter conducting is what it's called. If any of you are ever familiar with Future Farmers of America. I came off a farm. Had a grand champion livestock showing at the Trinity Valley Exposition in Liberty, Texas. Yes, I've been over most of this country on horseback. I hunted and fished the Trinity River Basin. Done all these things. I'm one of you. 
Nobody gave me anything. My dad said, when I got ready to go to school, he said, you saved your money. I think it's a good idea for you to get a college education. Great idea. I graduated in a class of 39 people. My dad said, it's a better idea if you pay for it. My dad was smart. He was very smart. Because here's what he told me all my life. You'll never appreciate what you don't work for. You will never appreciate what you don't work for. So in four years, somehow I managed to accumulate 145 hours and graduate on time. Somehow. My wife Cheryl is with me here tonight. Cheryl and I have been married many, many moons. I'm not going to say the number because that would give away something. We have five children. Four of them are grown. We have five grandchildren. I came to this place to say, I'm one of you. I'm going to represent you. When it came time to represent Chambers County, you've got the people here that know how to articulate the issues. I don't have a preset agenda. I don't represent the people in Midland. I don't represent the people in Austin. I don't represent the people in El Paso or Houston. I don't live in Houston. I've never lived in Houston. I'm one of the few people in this room, probably over the age of 50, that voted Republican for every president every year. Every year. I never voted Democrat. Never. I don't need somebody to tell me right from wrong. I know right from wrong. I live it every day. Every day. I know what to do and I know how to do it. I am effective. There's something about being effective that bothers some people. Because they see Washington, D.C. and wonder why we can't get payment for Harvey. There's a reason. we got people at war, and they're not working for us. She's telling me my time's up. Thank you. RPT State Convention, over 7,000 delegates voted in favor of electing the Texas House Speaker during the Republican House Caucus with a secret ballot as outlined in our, plan our platform plank 70 on page 9 and our SREC overwhelmingly passes resolution reaffirming this procedure. Would you support this procedure? If no, why? And if yes, would you advocate for this procedure publicly to your fellow House members and constituents? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely yes. Uh, we did do that. I do understand that it is a part of the plank of the Republican platform. Let me just say this. In 1980, when Cheryl and I got involved in the Republican Party, 1980, that's before some of you were born, okay? Uh, we got children that age. I worked, got, we, get, we went in and went to work. We didn't go in and start telling everybody that was there they didn't know what they were doing. Yeah, there weren't many of us. You could have put Galveston County in a phone booth for the Republican Party. Everybody voted Democrat. There were no Republicans. So we didn't have a lot of arguments because we had to have each other's back. So the first thing I did, I became a precinct chairman. And I began to try to recruit Republicans into the party. Let's build the party. Let's find people who have the same core values we do. They had them, but they were just too shy to admit it. And they didn't want their friends to know that they weren't a Democrat. Because it wasn't popular. It wasn't popular. After that, I became an election worker, where I worked at the elections. Then I became a poll watcher. And here's what I saw. Buses of people pulling up being handed a sack lunch and a $5 bill, being led into the polling place and saying, pull the D-lever. That's what I saw. You won't see that today. But that's what I saw. Then I became an election judge. Then I became an, a, a delegate to the county convention, helped write the platform, and then went to the state convention. So absolutely, we need to elect. I signed the pledge. 
You bet I did. Because we're going to elect in caucus a Republican speaker for the House of Representatives. Thank you. Property tax reform was a legislative priority that called for the system to be replaced with an alternative other than the income tax and would require voter approval to increase the overall tax burden. What property tax reform, what would property tax reform look like to you? Would property tax reform be a priority for you during session and how would you work to make it happen? If not, why and what issue is of greater importance? Very good question. Property tax reform is my priority. It's my priority. It has to be. It has to be. I live under the same system you live under. I don't, I don't live in Washington, D.C. I live in the same system you live under. We absolutely must find a way to reform property taxes. We have a Ways and Means Committee in the House of Representatives. And by the way, I voted for every property tax cut that's come up, every one. In 2015, we, we increased the homestead exemption to $25,000. I, I voted for that. Co-sponsoring that. Franchise tax, small businesses, 25% cut. We wanted to do more. What we wanted to do was to find a way to not just cut the franchise tax, but to cut the state sales tax. Property taxes are a local level. What is the number one driver of property taxes? It's our schools. It's our schools. It's the schools. It's usually then maybe the county and then followed by the city and then some of the other uh, entities that are there. You have school board trustees, you have county officials, and then you have the appraisal district. There's a problem with the excuse me. There's a problem with the, with the appraisal district in the sense that your appraisal keeps going up and up and up. Good news, yes, if you're selling your property, but not good news if you're having to pay taxes. Not good news if you're having to pay taxes. We have to understand the connection between what the government's role is and what the local government role is. Well, you want local control. I really don't believe you want the state of Texas dictating always what you do here. Let me give an example. Some of my colleagues voted against allowing El Paso to build a convention center. That's really not my fight. That's not my fight. If the people of El Paso want to vote themselves a tax or a bond to build a convention center, that's on them. Don't, don't come to my district and do that because the voters have to approve that and the voters should approve it. We need an engaged citizenry. We absolutely do. This time, I say Chambers County, $6 million. How to do that? Well, we have an improvement district over here that the roadways were supposed to be maintained by the county. When that district came into being, there was a clause in there that said that the county would maintain those roads. Well, that's not a good idea for the county because that improvement district had already set aside the fees and assessment on themselves to rebuild their roads, but they couldn't because of that clause in their originating documents. So I went in legislatively and changed that, took the burden off the county and allowed that industrial district to build their own roads. We're going to have to do this consistently. We need your help. The agenda we carry is from you. Is from you. There is no magic bullet. We've got a commission right now with 13 people trying to find a way to reform and revitalize the property tax system for public schools. And education takes a kid like me off the farm and gives me an opportunity to make a living I'd never have otherwise. I got that from public school. I didn't get it from a private school. I didn't get it anywhere else. It's very difficult. We're asking the public school to be everything to all people. But it's a reflection of our community. It's a reflection of our community. And, and we, we kind of get what we pay for in that sense. But we have to, the, the, the funding system has been cobbled together since 1947. It's been piecemeal, piecemeal, piecemeal. We have to change it. We have to find a better way to fund our public schools. We must, we must. 
If you don't like what goes on here in the county, vote out your county officials. Vote out your county judge. Vote out your county commissioners. Larry, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> but to communicate with them. Let them know what your priorities are. We represent you. It, it's, not about, it's not about me. I'm going to carry the water that you want me to carry. We're a party that is pro-life and holds its stance as a core value. The Republican Party platform even goes as far to call for the total abolishment of abortion. Do you believe that abortion is murder and should be treated as such? Well, let me tell you this. It's 100% fatal to the baby. It's 100% fatal every time. Every time an abortion occurs, that child dies. And that child didn't ask to be born. That child didn't ask to be conceived. Absolutely. I have five children, and I've had people tell me, Wayne, why do you have five children? Don't you know what causes that? Thinking they're funny. You think that's funny? I don't think it's a bit funny. So let me tell you, what was my answer? Here's what I told them. I'm just a simple country boy. There won't be any highways, libraries, or bridges named after me. The only people I'm going to leave behind are those people that bear my name. That's a God's truth. Let me tell you something. I'm not my own. I love the Lord. The beginning of wisdom is what? Where does the beginning of wisdom start? It's the fear of the Lord. What does that fear mean? What does that word fear mean? It means a reverential respect. It means that I understand that he's watching. And not only is he watching, he's orchestrating. And he's going to hold me accountable for not just what I do and say, but for what I don't do and say. The scripture says pure and undefiled religion is the care of widows and orphans. It's the most vulnerable in our population that determines how a society goes. How we treat them. How we treat them. It matters. It absolutely matters. I helped pass 10 pro-life bills this session. 10. There were, there were some my colleagues, there were some of my colleagues that passed zero. Passed nothing. They passed no bills. How about judicial bypass where a minor can get an abortion without the parent's consent? Not now. It'll, it'll be tried in the courts, but not now. How about dismemberment? Fetal dismemberment? No. What about the sale of and harvest of body parts of babies? No. What about doctors that don't report complications after <laughs> surgery? Yes, they will. And what about doctors that don't have privileges in hospitals? What about them? Not now. 100% pro-life. 100% voting record. This is not up for debate. This is not, if I were there, this is what I would do. I've done it. I've stood there, and I've made those votes, and I've watched my colleagues do that and encourage them. We have to stand for the unborn. We have to. If we don't, next they're coming for me and you. End-of-life bills were passed this time as well. Part of the pro-life movement. The way we treat our elderly and infirm matters. It absolutely matters. I'm passionate about this. We absolutely have to do this. We have to stand for those who cannot speak for themselves. Thank you. This part of the district is largely country, and most students as a result are educated through a public school setting. Regulations and accountability have only increased on public schools in recent years. And the same accountability scores are then determined by state agencies and policymakers who have no classroom awareness of the vast spectrum of needs that a classroom of student, students need. As a policymaker, how would you work with public schools to develop an appropriate accountability system in our state that would hold the school districts accountable to key academic areas like math, reading, civics, and science but in turn allow them to compete with private education bodies that are not held to the same rigorous accountability standards. 
That's a mouthful. That's a lot of questions. Uh, let me just say this. Cheryl and I not only have a large family, but we continue to invest in the lives of those around us, <coughs> our grandchildren. It matters. She and I both came out of the education system. I was a teacher and a coach for three years. I almost starved to death. And no, A&M didn't call me and ask me to interview them. <laughs> I'd have been glad to be head coach at A&M, but they didn't call me. Uh, so I knew that I was not going to be able to feed my family. That's sad, folks. What a sad deal. That I was not going to be able to take care of my family if I stayed as a teacher and a coach. If I were to tell you what my first contract was, you'd have a heart attack. We owe a debt of gratitude to all of our teachers and our coaches and our parents and people who are engaged here and our grandparents. We owe them our respect just like we do our military. They are sacrificing. They're not doing it for the money. They're sacrificing their life to try to mold the young people, the pathway out of poverty. That's what an education is. My dad used to say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But I'll tell you what I can do, Wayne, I can salt the oats. I can salt the oats, and that's what teachers do. Good teachers salt the oats. They make you want to drink. They make you want to learn more. It matters. It absolutely matters. We're very good as bureaucrats. I'm not a bureaucrat, but there are bureaucrats there that, that, that tell us how to do it. And you're exactly right. Why do we have people making policy that aren't in the classroom? Why are we doing that? We've got standards, we've got rigors, we put them on a scale and we weigh them. You don't fatten the steer by weighing it. You don't. We, we shouldn't do that. I have a relationship with every school district, nine of them. You know what I do? I call, I go see them, I listen. Tell me what I can do to help you. Tell me what I can do to help your teachers. Tell me what I can do to be more effective. You know how many kids we have in the public school system in the state of Texas? 5.4 million. 5.4 million school kids in the public schools. This year we're going to add 83,000 kids to the system. You know what it costs to do that? It costs to educate those 83,000 kids? $2.1 billion. You know what it's going to cost if we don't educate them? Many, many times multiple that because we're going to put them in the penal system when they don't have any skill, they don't have any job, they don't have any hope, they don't have any future without an education. I'm encouraging the people in my district, if you have white hair or you don't have any hair at all, if you're retired, go to the school and find somebody to love on. Go to the school and find a kid that nobody cares about and take them <laughs> under your wing and encourage them. Love on them. Nurture them. They don't get that at home. What's the single most important factor of a child's education? The home environment. The home environment. My mom and dad weren't Ozzie and Harriet. Not hardly. We lived in the country. We had to work. But let me tell you something. Old Wayne had to do his homework or there were repercussions from that. Old Wayne had to take care of his business at school or my dad took care of when I got home. That's what we need to do today. We need to genuinely care about the kids that are in our school system. And we do that by showing up. You can pretend to care. You can't pretend to be there. You can't. We spend too much time telling schools how to educate our kids. We're not professional educators. Why don't we treat them like professionals? Why don't we do that? That's what I'm trying to do. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to work with them to help, not go in and criticize and tell them they're coming and doing a good job. We're losing teachers right and left. They're dropping out. I work with the Commissioner of Education, Mike Morath, and I said, Mike, what can I do to be more effective? What can I do as a state representative to be more effective? I want to represent the people in my district. I want those kids to have a chance. Everybody's not, you're going to have to go to public school, charter school, private school, home school. All those work. There's no one size that fits all for education. 
But you have to engage the kid to make sure that they want to learn. Thank you. When I first envisioned this, I thought I'd be sitting at a table and we'd be talking, but it didn't quite turn out that way. But uh, anyway, it's a... Uh, let me just say, I'm very proud to represent you. A Republican says, I think you know best how to spend your money than any government entity. Republican's not a pledge card, it's not a sign, it's not a form. It just says that we want a, we want to lower taxes as Republicans. We want reasonable regulation and we want to help create a climate for business for business to succeed. If you don't have a job, I can tell you what Christmas is going to be like. It's not going to be fun. We have to keep make sure our businesses can succeed. If you're a farmer, you're at risk. Anybody who's farming, I've done a little farming, let me tell you something, never was successful at it. You're at risk because you're subject to the elements. You're subject to nature. You're on your knees before God. And you're saying, dear God, let the crop come in this year. And God doesn't always say yes. Doesn't always work that way. You're at risk. You don't get a 100% voting record, as I have gotten, pro-life, pro-business, every tax cut that's been out there I've voted for, because I believe that's what we should do. I don't think government ought to lead the charge. We need, I, think we, I think we need to have a small, efficient government. Absolutely. I don't tell y'all how to run Chambers County. You have elected officials for that. I'm your elected official that says, let me do what I can do to help. Let me give you a great example of that. Just east of 3180, there is a new Budweiser distributorship going in. Anybody seen that? About $25 million. Pretty nice piece of real estate. Well, I find out that there's a problem that there's an impasse between the county and the state. And so I asked the people to get together. We sit down and hammer out a deal. What was it over? It's over drainage and it's over an open culvert. The man that's investing $25 million did not want an open ditch in the front of his brand new property. Simple thing. You would think that would be something simple to do. 